Hi, I'm Pastor Goodman. And this is the Lord's Feedback God's Life. Okay, hypothetical situation. Say there was this guy named, I don't know, Noah. And um, when Noah was alive, everybody else was just awful. Um, and, and also very, very faithless. And there came a point where it became so dangerous to be in this world that God couldn't handle leaving Noah alone in it like this anymore and said to him, you're going to need to build a really big boat and like put some animals on it and stuff because it's going to rain a lot. In this purely hypothetical situation, what saved Noah when the rains came? Was it God or the ark? Now you can say that God saved Noah, but then again, everybody who wasn't on the ark might say that the ark was actually pretty important when it started raining. I tricked you. It's not hypothetical at all. This really happened. And the blessed apostle Peter tells us that this Noah and the ark corresponds to baptism. And he also says it now saves you. And it's actually quite similar. What saved you, baptism or God? Now, you can say that God saved you, and that's true. But how he did it matters. He saved you through baptism, in the same way that he saved Noah through the ark. In the large catechism, Luther writes about maintaining this understanding. He says, But as our would-be wise new spirits assert that faith alone saves and that works and external things avail nothing, we answer, it is true, indeed, that nothing in us is of any avail but faith, as we shall hear still further. But these blind guides are unwilling to see this, namely, that faith must have something which it believes, that is, of which it takes hold, upon which it stands and rests. Thus faith clings to the water and believes that it is baptism, in which there is pure salvation and life, not through the water, as we have sufficiently stated, but through the fact that it is embodied in the word and institution of God, and the name of God inheres in it. Now, if I believe this, what else is it than believing in God as him who has given and planted his word into this ordinance, and proposes to us this external thing wherein we may apprehend such a treasure? Say, hypothetically, we're back with Noah. Say, hypothetically, it's like day 38 and all the rain and can't see any mountains. It's, it's terrible out there. And Noah gets it in his head. You know what? God, I don't need this boat anymore. I got this under control. And then he jumps off the boat into the water. How does that go for Noah? In the same way, say there is a person who is baptized as a child raised in the church and through temptation of sin and the world and the devil decides, I don't need this church. I don't need this baptism. And he jumps out of the ark that is the church. How's that go? You see, the problem isn't with the ark. The problem is that Noah's being an idiot and he needs to get back in the boat because it's safe there. But God in his mercy reaches out through that to pull us back in. God works through means. So what do the clear words of Scripture teach about baptism? Because if you say that baptism doesn't save you, you're going to have to somehow deal with the fact that the God that you trust in points to it and said, hey, look, that thing right there, baptism now saves you. What God does and works in us, he proposes to work through such external ordinances, Wherever, therefore, he speaks, yea, in whichever direction or by whatever means he speaks, thither faith must look, and to that it must hold. Now, here we have the words, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What else do they refer to then? Baptism, that is, to the water comprehended in God's ordinance. Hence it follows that whoever rejects baptism rejects the word of God, faith, and Christ, who directs us thither and binds us to baptism. See, we trust in our baptism because the God that we trust in pointed at it and said, look, this thing is going to work for you. It's not that we're setting 
baptism over God. It's that we trust God. And so when his word and command says, get baptized and through this I will save you, we who trust God cling then to the water. To try and take baptism and set it against God and say baptism doesn't save you, God saves you. It's to do this really awful, nasty, tricky thing. Sort of like when I almost got you about that Noah character. It's to take two things that God gives and set them against each other. And every single time, it is because we're trying to get out of one of them. Set God against baptism. But for some reason, it's never to extol baptism and God. It's usually to pick one or the other. In other words, to extol baptism over God is to say, once I was baptized, I never once need to hear his word or receive his gifts ever again because, well, I've got my baptism. And in the same way, to extol God over baptism is to say that God, who has promised to work through this means, I don't want the means that he's promised to work through. I don't need the things that God promises are good. Neither are good. Neither are good. It's like when people try and take the law and the gospel and set them against each other and said, well, since Jesus died for us, we don't need the law anymore. Wrong. It's not that the law is bad. The law is good because it came from a good God. And the law and the gospel, they don't work against each other. They work together for your good. And in the same way, baptism and your God, they don't work against each other. God works through baptism to save you. God works through means. He takes water and his word and even the human hands that would apply it. And here he gives you a blessed sacrament that just like the apostle says, now saves you.